Welcome to the celebration of you. I'm your host, Holly Dowling. I'm thrilled to share with you incredible people from all over the world who are living and leading extraordinary lives. From overcoming immense adversity to discovering the secret sauce to leading with courage and grace, their stories are going to bring you hope and inspiration. Now, let the stories begin. So excited to um, introduce you to this week's amazing guest. And for everybody out there, I know I keep saying it, but I never, ever want to stop being in a place of gratitude. This show was a mission on my heart almost three years ago, and we are listened in over 150, like 160 countries. And I thank everyone out there that's listening because... Um, the stories you hear, no matter what type of story it is, it always brings you hope, inspiration, whatever that is. So I thank you for all the listeners and excited to introduce you to my guest today because there's always a story, right? There's always a reason how I've invited this person to be on the show. And this person has no idea that I'm about to surprise him with a kudos that he changed my life. But we'll get there in a minute because at first I'd like <laughs> to introduce you to the incredible, amazing, and I'm going to call you an extraordinary leader because you truly are extraordinary, Rob. Rob Spessard, thank you for being with me today. Well, thank you that for that, Holly. I appreciate it. Well, you know, Glad to be here. It's funny how you meet somebody, right? And we'll, we'll go back to how we met. And then certain people you just stay connected with, right? Absolutely. Like I say, nothing happens in act, uh, on accident in this, in this life. I'm a big believer in that. I know. And you know what's great is the listeners know I'm always talking about serendipity. And if you're willing to be open to what is happening around you, there's doors that open that you won't, you'll miss if you're not open to that. And you are truly an example of that. So Rob, let's go back. It's been, gosh, about a year and a half ago. Well, it was a year ago, February, and we met in Naples, Florida, uh, as you were one of the big time partners of a company at the time, Cumberland for, um, Cisco. And I was the keynote speaker and Afterwards, we connected and talked at dinner and talked and just stayed in touch. And uh, I have to go back to that because staying in touch with you, you know, you're an example of somebody that's been to me in my eyes and all the leaders, I companies I get to work with around the world. You truly embody the passion for people and you are now taking a pause to reset, right? And figure out what you're going to do next. So let's start with, uh, talk about your most recent company you were one of the leaders of and this background you have in this fast paced digital technology space in our world, right, dear? <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Fast paced is uh, probably an understatement. Um, it changes uh, so fast. It's, uh, it's mind numbing. Uh, and I'm sure everybody in this industry feels the same way. Um, so yeah, the last company I was with, uh, Cumberland Group, a uh, fantastic company, great group of guys. Uh, I'm still very closely connected with the leadership there. Um, talk to them frequently, uh, play golf with a couple of the guys there still to this day. It's a great group of people. Um, you know, we grew that, grew that business, uh, from when I started there, the company was, uh, roughly 50 million, 55 million in revenue and now they're 200 million, uh, plus, um, great growth, uh, in the company started in the data center world and expanded from there. Um, and then prior to that in my life, um, I've been blessed to, to be in uh, a couple other growth companies. Um, one was, uh, before that was Nexus, which is a California based, uh, reseller system integrator consulting company. Um, I opened up the East Coast, Southeast for them. Uh, we grew that business to uh, about a quarter of a billion and sold that uh, company to Dimension Data. Uh, and then prior to that was with the predecessor of uh, Presidio called SolarCom. So that's three times where we've taken kind of smaller organizations and grown them and sold them to much larger organizations over time. Um, so recently, um, I've uh, um, cashed out my equity at uh, Cumberland, and uh, now I sit uh, at a point in my life, in my career, where I'm uh, kind of seeing where life's going to lead me next. Um, I've formed a, uh, an advisory company as, as kind of a, uh, a holding place for me uh, as I figure out where uh, I'm going to go next uh, in the kind of a growth advisory services business. Uh, I call it extra net, but uh, that's really unimportant at this point. Um, so like I said, I'm, I'm a big believer in uh, nothing in this uh, life ha happens on accident. Um, I met uh, 
uh, you you and I met uh, at a at a Cisco event, and um, you know you and I are both connected to a lot of people in the technology world and the Cisco ecosystem and all the surrounding places. And we've talked about the different people we've run into, and um, that served me well over my career. And um, as I went to different organizations, uh, a group of those individuals uh, followed with me um, as I went to different places. Um, and, and, and it really kind of illustrated, um, the benefit of what, re- what really happens of value, uh, inside of any growing company. Um, it, it, you know, people say it's, it's the people. It is the people, but it, more important than that, what I've really seen, um, creates true lasting value in any company. It's not the numbers and the P's and Q's. It, it really is that undefinable, glue that everybody calls culture. I know that sounds trite and I know everybody talks about it, Mm -hmm. but it truly is the most valuable asset that any company has. And it, but, but it is a very difficult thing to keep your hands on. Uh, It's something that has to come from the ground of the company and be supported at the top. It has to constantly be defended uh, jealously defended and fed and protected uh, and invested in uh, on a daily basis. As soon as that gets eroded, um, that's the beginning of the end. Um, because when anybody in the organization, in particular, in particular your very best people, um, start to feel that going to work is just a paycheck, mm-hmm. um, you're dead. Mm-hmm. Because the very best people can earn a living anywhere. Uh, they're going to earn a living where they um, find the most uh, intrinsic value for their personal um, life and where they really uh, feel that personal connection. They can make money anywhere. If it just becomes a paycheck, you're doomed. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in my career. Uh, And it's devastating to watch. Mm. Um, And it's really rejuvenating to see the opposite happen. Um, I've been in companies where I've been in markets that are highly, highly competitive and new companies coming into a market and everybody told me, are you crazy? You know, you can't build a company in this market. There's too many competitors. It's cutthroat. It's, you know, the, the pricing is ridiculous. You're wasting your time. Um, and we didn't waste our time. And we were, we grew ex- explosively and we did protect our margins and the customers loved us uh, and we built very profitable companies. Uh, And the reason was because we did have that culture and the customers Mm -hmm. felt it. It was palpable. That's it. Um, They felt it. And that, and that was, that was the defining difference. It really was. And and I've always said our number one asset chooses to go home every night because in our business, we don't manufacture anything. They can choose to go home every night and they can choose to not come back the next day because the last time I checked, indentured servitude was illegal. <laughs> oh, oh, Rob, I, my head, I am sitting here smiling with my eyes closed. I'm like going, oh, you have just nailed so many things. And I've got to, I don't want anybody to miss something you just said because it's the undefined, but the unequivocal the impact of having the culture. And you're right. It's such a buzzword right now. People are talking about culture, 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 but it's like getting granular around what does that mean? And you just nailed it. It's about the people and knowing that they could be gone tomorrow. And what, what creates that environment and that culture that retains great talent? Because, you know, you hear a lot of talk. Well, when I was with you a year ago, one of the big things was, you know, how do we help uh, clients? It's a fast paced industry, right? It's not just about attracting great talent. It's about retaining them because there's always somebody at your heels ready to nab that good high performer. And um, so when you think about all of these companies that you've helped grow, you've helped build them to these unbelievable places, and you can go back and each one of these, I'd love for you to share I know you're very humble and this isn't about bragging, but it really is kind of about bragging, Rob, because I'm going to celebrate you right now. What do you think that secret sauce is when you've done this over and over? Could you share just maybe one or two tips? Because we have a lot of leaders in the world that are listening to the show. What tips would you say that have been your secret sauce in creating those cultures? I don't know that I have a secret sauce. I, I, I was, uh, 
I was taught by my father who I consider to be, you know, my personal idol um, and my professional idol. I mean, he ran sales for the Americas for Unilever at the end of his career. Um, he still lives here in Atlanta, but uh, he's always been my idol. And he always taught me um, growing up a lot of things that I took to heart in my personal life as well as my career. Um, you know, one of the things he uh, said to me, you know, little little tidbits that I keep with me. You know, he always said, you know, that saying that you hear good guys finish last. And he would always say to me, good guys finish first. And then he would pause and then he would say, it just takes longer. Mm. And, you know, and it goes back to do the right thing. Um, just do the right thing. And sometimes, you know, things take longer that way. Don't, you know, he would say, don't take shortcuts because, you know, <laughs> karma will get you when you do. <laughs> Isn't that the um, yep. You know, you know, the things that you hear, um, you know, good, you know, uh, share uh, good news slow and bad news fast, uh, those kind of things. Um, and, you know, one of the things he said, uh, you know, as he was uh, going through his working career, he said that, um, you know, talking about um, self-embellishment and bragging and so forth, he always cautioned me not to do that. And he said that, you know, when you talk about personal failures or embarrassments or things that didn't go right, you share those with your team readily. Mm-hmm. Um, and when there's successes, you, you only really share those as needed. And when you do, you share those with, with, uh, monikers of we, not I, mm. when they're personal failures or missteps or whatever, that's where you say I, when they're successes or positive things, that's when you use the term we, mm. um, and, and he said, you know, that intrinsically, you know, again, they sound a little trite to some people and whatever, but if you use it as a constant um, vernacular, it, it starts to sink in. Um, and one of the things I try to do, you know, when I'm hiring people and the people I like to hang around with and the people I like to hire in, in my personal life, too, is, you know, how people conduct themselves in their personal lives, Um Translates how they handle themselves in the working world mm. most most mm-hmm. all the time. Um, and you can, you know, I, I've been blessed to be able to kind of see that um, in people. I, I, um, and and it, it pays huge dividends. And, and customers can see it. They can see dis- disingenuous behavior pretty quick. Well, let's face so, it. It's empathy, right? You can read. You, people know if we are authentic and transparent and truly genuine. I mean, we, you know, you can sniff it out with somebody, just a complete stranger at a grocery store. Um, you know, it's just having that heightened awareness. And you know what I love too, is it's when I heard you say, and I love the wisdom that your father has instilled and the way you were raised. And I want to go back to the younger years because it was a perfect transition. And just before we do that, Rob, I don't want anybody to miss that those few, as you called them, they might seem a little bit trite, but they're really not. They're very profound ways to choose to show up as a human being in our world and how we treat others. And I think of that as your compass. That was kind of like your compass that's guided you, hasn't it? Yeah, it absolutely has. Um, especially in those times when, when you're hitting some rough spots. Um, if you lean back on them, they, they kind of give you a sense of, uh, of comfort. Um, uh, and, and that's, that's, you know, if you, if you don't have those as kind of your comfort, uh, and your compass, you tend to make rash decisions and do things that, you know, may not be in your best interest longer term. Mm -hmm. So, um, they've served me well. And I, you know, I was really blessed to have a father that uh, lived that way. You know, one of the things that uh, I tell people about him that I think is um, uh, illustrative of the kind of man he is or was uh, in his working life is he was a very busy person. I mean, he ran a very large organization, but growing up as a kid, and I know he did, but growing up as a kid, I cannot remember him missing any single important event in my life. I can never remember him missing an important ball game. Wow. Anything, any award I got at school, I can't remember him missing a single one. I know he did. He had to have, but I don't remember him ever missing one. Wow. Wow. Um, 
because when you when the kids you know kids that I you know people I grew up with you know when they when they do notice somebody missing one of those important events it sticks with them. Mm-hmm. I think you you can translate that into um, into the work environment. I think uh, I remember somebody saying one of the things that uh, he tells leaders and they, what this is not me is some, something I heard somebody else says you know catch somebody doing something right. Mm-hmm. In a work environment, which I thought was pretty cool. That's so. That's a very big. I'm I'm a big believer in that, and really try to help continue to be a messenger of that, Rob. Because you know, especially as colleagues and teams, this isn't about just your boss catching somebody doing something great. When we can create a culture where we're focusing on what people bring and shining a spotlight, right, on catching them doing something great, what does that do? It's like the book by Ken Blanchard. Well done. You encourage more great behavior. Because we tend to as a society, and it goes back to even our earlier years as children, and no offense and no no pointing fingers at anybody, but we are raised in an environment where we take for granted so much of what we do do well because we think we're always fixing and, and trying to add to our life what is inept. You know, the infamous saying, we take for granted what God put in and try to put in what was left out. It should be the opposite. Explode what God put in and don't worry about the other stuff. So... um I love that. I have yeah, to you, take, but go ahead. What were we going to say? <laughs> yeah, you, you kind you kind of have to let him drive. It's uh, you know the, the complication of this, uh, the, especially the technology world we live in. Um, it's so complex. You you have to you have to continue to make sure that you open yourself up to learning something new every day, uh, and don't think you've got it all figured out because, good lord, um, it, it is so complicated. Um, that you, you have to continue to make sure you enable a learning organization. Um, and sometimes th- that becomes so overwhelming. I mean, there are certain points in time when you kind of have to say, I can't, I can't even, not only can I not know any, everything, I can't, we, we as an organization can't learn everything. It's just too much. <laughs> you have to focus. And there, there is a balancing act there. It, it really is. Um, it is it is a task of balance um, from a success standpoint. It really is. Yeah, I'm picturing the teeter totter, right? Like as yeah. even as leaders mm-hmm. at the very top, that's a teeter totter, and nobody's, you know, that pressure of feeling that you've got to have it all and have this organization doing it all. And you're right, like there comes a point where it's about balance and and, and knowing when to step back and knowing when to step forward. Um, I have I'm so intrigued because I love. I've, I've loved from the moment we started connecting just your passion and your respect for your father, which I thank you for sharing that. And I want to go back to your younger years. Um, tell us a little bit about younger version of Rob. I mean, was there a point and, and you know, maybe it goes back to childhood, elementary, middle school, high school, maybe college. I don't know, but was there a moment as a younger version of you that you had a pivotal moment? Maybe there was a, an, you had, you overcome some adversity and there was a challenge you had to overcome and it just gave you such fire and passion in you. I mean, I don't know. So I'm always intrigued to find out what was a pivotal moment for Rob in his younger years. (laughs) Well, I mean, I was uh, fortunate enough. I I didn't have a lot of diversity, uh, in my life, um, compared to a lot of the stories I've heard, but, um, I guess the uh, adversity that I have had in my um, professional life was self-imposed. And by that, I mean that, um, you know, as soon as I hit the working world out of college, I was um, way overconfident (laughs) right out of college. (laughs) Right out of college, I thought, you know, all these people get out of my way. I should be CEO of this place. Um, And God, was I wrong. Um, (laughs) So, um, <clears throat> you know, your ego is not your amigo for sure. Um, so, um, I was the over exuberant youth in the workplace for sure. Uh, and I had to get that out of my way. Um, and that, that took uh, a while. So, um, and I guess that, uh, you know, it took a while for, <laughs> for me to kind of work through that. Um, I was definitely the over, over exuberant youth uh, early in my career. Um, so I guess, I guess that, uh, the disappointments that I saw early in my career when I, you know, I didn't achieve what I wanted as quickly as I wanted and didn't get those promotions at the pace I thought I should have gotten those, um, 
those were learning events for me, you know, and I, I needed to beat some of that out of myself. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, love that. I love the ego yeah. is not my amigo. Right, that was a good yeah. one. I wrote that one down because I just was like, oh, that's good. And, you know, it's so, <laughs> and, it, and it's great because, you know, you're right. Not everybody has, you know, these incredible, like overwhelming catastrophic adversity, you know, that comes into their life. It's more about knowing what have you pushed through? What have you overcome? And, and even by just admitting, you know, I, you know, came into the workforce with this huge ego and had to learn really quick that that's not going to serve you well. And being, no. um, right. And being this amazing, humble, like I've, I really mean this from my heart. When I think about who you are and who I've known you to be, and, and now as my friend, you just embody humility and grace and to be a true, such a successful leader that has carried that. And there is no ego around you. So it's beautiful that you can go back to that time and say, that was the best time for me to learn those lessons early. And, uh, well, and I, I think one of the things that, um, I, I you don't want to squash the confidence of highly successful people for sure, especially when they're younger in the workplace. They're, they need to feed off of that. Um, and there's a balance between confidence and overactive ego. You know, the, you, you don't want overactive ego, um, but you don't want to squash the confidence. You know, I think that uh, there was a, some, somebody else, not me, um, said something about humility and I think it's something like, you know, being humble does not mean that you think less of yourself. It means that you think of yourself less. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's a difference. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that that balancing act uh, is, is something that's appropriate. Um, you know, you, you, you have to have confidence. If you don't have confidence, it's, it's, you know, you're not, you're not going to do your best from a work environment. But by the same token, you have to value what you learn from everybody around you. I mean, I like you, there is, I truly believe there is no such thing as a bad, um, interaction with another human, human being. Yeah. And then by that, I mean, you can learn something from every interaction. Now, mm. sometimes what you're learning is what not to do. Mm. Sometimes you're learning, I don't want to do that. And sometimes you're learning, I do want to do that, or I'm, it's a positive learning. And sometimes it's a negative learning, but you're always learning. Mm. I love and, that. That's a, that's it, a really profound. If you can look at every, it's like looking at every challenge is truly a gift and an opportunity. You can learn something. You're exactly right. Mm. That's what makes life fun, right? I know my <laughs> friend. Well, you know what, as we wrap this up, two things very quickly, would you tell everybody about, um, the growth advisory service? Cause I mean, I have to say, I'm going to say this to everybody and to all the listeners, but knowing Rob to everyone, I am so excited because I firmly believe his expertise, his wisdom, all that he's done over the years. I'm like, please, please, please take your expertise and become an advisor and help other companies that are growing. Right? Like I'm just like the little friend out here going, please go do that. Um, in your world of what's next, uh, share with us kind of what you're exploring right now, Rob. I mean, you're open, right? All kinds of things could happen. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where it's uh, going to lead. It's not like I have a master plan at this point, but, um, you know, I, you know it's in my background, I've, I've done finance work. I've done, um, equity raises. I've done leverage buyouts and I've done venture capital, but I've also led sales organizations, excuse me, professional services and engineering organizations and marketing organizations. Um, that's the only thing I haven't done in my career is back office operations. But um, one of the things that um, I keep getting touched um, by from people in the org in, in this business, that is the, for lack of a better way to say it, the, the channel space is that, you know, a lot of companies that are pick a number, they're 30, 50 million, you know, looking to grow to that quarter of a billion or half a billion mark uh, are looking for, they want to build a sales organization <clears throat> to get to that next level. So they want to grow to that quarter of a billion dollar mark, or um, they want to enter a new market geographically. They want to enter a new, uh, present a new offering. They want to get into cloud or whatever, and some kind of new offering or IOT. Um, they need to prepare for or deal with a merger acquisition. They need to talk to the venture capital community uh, and negotiate equity raises. Um, they need to align or realign their culture. 
Um, all of that kind of has to do with growth. Um, and I've done that successfully, um, in, in multiple organizations and they've, you know, ended up, you know, being, you know, growth opportunities and in a couple of cases have been, uh, good liquidity events for, um, the people involved. Um, and there are, apparently it you know, is a uh, growing need for that, uh, in this, um, channel world. Um, so I've started to have some discussions with people in that space, uh, and that may end up to be, uh, some opportunities for some advisory, um, opportunities in that space. Um, or it may end up being uh, longer term for one of those particular companies. I'm not sure where that's going to lead me, but, uh, we'll see. I love it. I, it's like a wide open, it's like a white canvas and you're getting to create your next beautiful piece of artwork and whatever that's going to look like, you can just hear it in your voice. You're not rushing it. You're not worrying about it. It's kind of like be ready and open as you've been saying throughout this entire conversation, right? It's be ready and be open and be willing to trust what comes next. And, uh, Oh Rob, I love this. And now I have to tell you something before we end this because, and I might, uh -oh. Get a, uh oh, here we go. I might get a little <laughs> emotional, but hang with me because, um, Wow, I am just getting a little choked up to tell you this. So in my lifetime, uh, you know, I don't do what I do to serve Holly. I've found my soul's highest calling, and, and it's really important to me that it's always being a messenger to empower people, right, and inspire people. And I believe in, I believe in everybody has gifts and all of that. And I love working with leaders to rekindle that. So all of that said, you did something for me that you may never realize the impact that you had on my life. So I remember when it was, it was last November, Rob, and you had pinged me, you know, we stayed in touch on LinkedIn, you know, every couple months, how you doing? And you had pinged me and you said, Hey, let me know. Um, can you send me your phone number or your email? So I, can we have a quick chat sometime, you know, when, when you're free or something like that. And it was like a couple weeks later, I pinged you and I said, sure, you know, here's my phone number. Call me whenever, um, I'm on the road so much. Rob, you called me and made an imprint on my life that I want every leader that's going to hear this to know, to never miss. I was in a cab. I had just landed from speaking in Salt Lake City, and I was in Chicago on my way to my hotel to speak for an event in Chicago, and I'm in the cab. I can remember the smell of the cab and where I was. I see you calling, and you're like, do you have a minute? I just would love to talk to you for a few minutes. Do you remember this moment, Rob? Yes. Okay. I do. Okay. Cause I can remember like where I was sitting in that cab and you said to me, my father told me that never forget to tell people that make an impact on your life and make an impression, let them know. And you said this last year, you were one of two people that made a true impact on my life. And I just wanted you to hear that. And I wanted to tell you, and I started to cry in the cab. I was like, are you serious? You just called to tell me that. And you said, yes. You said, don't want to bother you. Just wanted you to know what you're doing is making a difference and you impacted my life. And I want to thank you for that because that made it, you have no idea how that sat in my heart and what that meant to me. Well, I didn't mean, mean to make you cry. <laughs> well, but you did. And it was tears of joy, my friend. <laughs> uh, well, so, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. But I meant it. Mm. That's for sure. Well, and as you've been talking about your father, I remembered that moment because you said your father taught you this, right? When you called me that day and I was so blown away. I just remember sitting there and I just remember, and you know me, I'm very open about my spirituality and like, it's, you know, I looked up at God and I was like, wow, it was like an angel just popped into that cap on that moment and just said, remember you're doing your soul's highest calling. So, um, Rob, thank you. Thank you for being in my life. Thank you for taking the time to let me celebrate you and share your incredible wisdom with the world. You know, I'm always here for you. And I think we're all excited to know what you're going to do next, but go enjoy some time on the beach with the family, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you too, Holly. And I'm sure we'll see each other soon. Yep. You're stuck. You're going to be stuck with me for the rest of your life, my friend. All right. All my best. Uh, be well, Holly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining me for another awesome celebration of you. 
If you were inspired by this story, please share it with your family and friends and hashtag your story matters. I'd love to hear from you. So please leave a comment on iTunes and absolutely please come to my website, hollydowling.com. Leave a comment there too. And while you're there, pick up your free gift. Most importantly though, just remember that your life is a gift from God. What you do with it is your gift back. Thank you.